Hello folks, how's everybody doing? Gonna have an exciting day today. We're gonna talk about doom and gloom. <laughs> uh, that's why I'm dressed appropriately for the occasion. Anyways, before I get into it, I wanna cover some of the comments that were made. And that's regarding some of the subjects we've been covering the last couple weeks, which is has to do with what is an object, what is time, what is motion, okay? Especially those, those three. And uh, here's the first comment, okay? Let's get on with it. Uh, that definition of time needs sharpening up. That's my definition of time, which is comparison of two motions, right? Not all events in physics involve motion. Oh, <laughs> uh, you look up the word event, it says something that happens, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, I guess uh, event means happens. Happens is a verb, so you have two or more uh locations per each uh event okay and here you get a a little uh glimpse of that here uh let me put this up here okay uh we discovered we covered that the other day where we have this box at different locations that's motion that's an event there a little film strip you need two frames but i put three just to uh show that we have motion okay so yeah i mean you know <laughs> Motion, two or more locations, and that's what an event is. Okay, an object can remain in one location and change state. Well, I don't know what state he's talking about. Maybe California, New York, I don't know. What do you mean change state? A change, the word change is already motion, okay? Let's keep that in mind. And so time is the comparison of two motions or change of state. <clears throat> Night. <laughs> no, no change of state. And... Um, and again, he gives the example, and you'll see why here. He says, uh, for example, in the kitchen, two eggs could boil uh, too hard, one after the other, whilst a tray of water freezes. We have two things, right? Eggs, tray of water, right? And so it is that eggs boil too hard at twice the rate uh, that water freezes. So we're talking about eggs versus water we're talking about the motion happening to boiling eggs and the motion happening to water so we're comparing two motions anyways so uh i don't think he made his case but maybe you can try better next time okay uh in fact uh i think i covered that the other day with good old isaac newton uh supposedly he had three laws of motion uh he never defined the word motion okay and do not define time, space, place, and motion, because we all know what it means, right? So why, why take the trouble? But he's credited with the three laws of motion. The first and third really are not his. They belong to Rene Descartes, who came several years before he did. And uh, the one I want to focus on is the law, the first law, okay? Everybody continues in its state of rest or of uniform motion in a right line meaning straight line, right? Unless it is compelled to change that state by forces impressed upon it. Well, uh, Newton had it wrong, okay? Newton had no idea what he was talking about because first of all, there is no such thing as rest. Not even God can rest in this universe. Uh, I wanna move God, very simple. He could be as powerful as he wants, but here I move my little index finger and I'm moving God right now because that Adam there at the end of my fingers changing his distance with respect to God. So not even God can stand still in our universe, okay? And so I don't know what he's talking about, rest. And then the other one is uniform motion in a straight line. No such thing in the universe. Uh, you know, right now we're rolling around the sun. Uh, those who are not flat earthers, okay, we're rolling around the sun. We're moving with respect to Jupiter and we're moving with respect to... Um, Alpha Centauri, the three-star system closest to the Earth, and we're moving with respect to the Andromeda galaxy, the center of the universe, etc., wherever we're at. So there is no such thing as straight line motion or rest. And so I don't know what Newton's talking about. What the mathematicians do, they, uh, you know, hammer a stake in the ground and they use that as a corner, right? And they say, look, we're, we're going to use this as a frame of reference. And so they gauge all their motion from that point. And that's cheating because there's no such thing as a fixed uh, point anywhere in the universe. Now, for mathematical purposes, they want to be able to control that and say, okay, let's put that as 
point zero, that's zero miles right there, and then from there we count motion and whatever. Yeah, they can do that. That's artificial, but that doesn't that doesn't affect the the fact that uh, motion is um, is universal and it's constant. It's never in a straight line. Okay, you can do whatever calculations you done you want and and uh, put whatever scenarios you want, but that doesn't mean that motion is in any way f uh, fixed from a given point. We do that on Earth to do our calculations. It's got nothing to do with the real physics that Mother Nature runs out there. Okay, that's my point. Okay, uh, let's get this one out of there. Another comment here says, uh, the terms he discusses, meaning, right, me, have already been defined. Oh, they have. I couldn't find a single definition, but okay. And it would be great if he stuck with those definitions. Okay, and he gave a series of uh, links there, and I didn't copy the links, but those are the questions that uh, were addressed in each one of those links. I, I only looked at a few of them, uh, too many, really, <laughs> for what they were worth, but here it is. Uh, what is time? And it says, curved time. That's what this guy talks about, the link where, where that was at. Curved time? says time is curved and yeah that's what general relativity says i mean it's that's what they say now whether it makes sense that's a separate issue they say curved time why because you gotta explain why the earth doesn't run away from the solar system okay and how do the relativists do it well they say look we're gonna warp space time so they're gonna use this depression in space time which means they're going to warp space time they're going to use it as a wall and they're going to say that you know the earth uh, goes around this wall that's that's what the uh, Einstein field equations say earth rolls around this wall like a little ball around the roulette okay that's what their that's their mechanism that's their physical interpretation of their equations and that's why the earth doesn't fly out of the solar system for that they had to bend time and even this guy admits, you know, it doesn't make any sense, but as he says, you know, uh, predictions uh, match reality. In other words, they say, uh, you know, whatever the equations say, uh, that's what we see out there. Well, no kidding. That's what the equations say because the equations are tailored to what we see out there. It's a description of something invisible, which in this case is space-time. And so the equations had better match what we have out there because they're just descriptions. It's like saying, you know, a chair has four legs. And you say, well, is that true? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, here's the equation, uh, chair equal four legs. You know, and, and, and it's uh, a, a fact by <laughs> uh, simply because it's a fact. But, but the, you know, it's, uh, the question is, what is the mechanism for, for bending of time? How can you imagine such a monster? And that's where the problem comes in, and that's and this guy even says it in his in his YouTube uh, video. Okay, then he talks about forward in time. What does that mean? What do you mean? Is time a like a box, and you move forward through the box through this container? Is that what time is? Some kind of physical entity? It talks about how causality. You know that that's essentially the definition of time. Now he has no definition of time. Nobody out there has one. That's why we had to define the word time for the mathematicians. We have no use for time in physics because time is only a description. In physics, we explain. In science, we explain. So time has nothing to do with either physics or science. Okay? What is an atom? Okay, let's see what, uh, what he showed for an atom. <laughs> here's, the, here's his uh, famous atom. And it's an atom I've seen before somewhere. I don't know. And it says the nucleus is made of protons and neutrons, and there's a cloud of electrons surrounding it. These are his words, okay? And so he's only got to answer one question, and that's the only question that Niels Bohr has to answer and all these other fellows. And that's, um, and, and the issue there is, uh, why do, do those electrons stay glued or faithful to the nucleus? Why don't they just spontaneously fly away what's keeping every electron buzzing around like bees around the hive you know uh, this is what you gotta answer <laughs> you gotta answer what physical entity is in contact uh, puts contact or makes contact between the electron and the nucleus that's what they gotta answer okay and until we have an answer to that you don't have an atom
because that's the only answer that you, that's the only uh, question you have to answer okay energy what is energy well he had a big hard time with that one and here's his uh, reply and uh, this is the, the uh, fellow and he's uh, great as a clown no doubt about that he should be a stand-up comedian but the science he delivers is uh, man it's way off the mark okay so uh, I don't know about him and he says energy isn't something tangible no kidding energy is a concept it better not be tangible I can't touch love I can't touch information and I can't touch energy or mass or field energy is not a thing by itself correct it's a property of things correct so what's what the heck is energy and then he says energy is the amount of stuff that could happen <laughs> and so these are the definitions he says this fellow says uh, are you know ground in stone and that I should work with those definitions no way this is garbage this is nonsense poppycock and then he goes with field and what is a field well he says assigning numbers to places okay so uh, here I've got a little uh, uh, little thing if I can find it here here where it is field of numbers okay here's the field of numbers so this is his oh sorry wrong one let me get this one right there it is that's what I want to say do or oh man okay so this is what he says he says the assigning numbers to places well there you have a bunch of numbers to places that's a field that's a vibrating field uh, does that make any sense is, is that a physical entity just a bunch of numbers that are vibrating or or assigning numbers to places so no we can't use any of the definitions this guy is proposing okay this is the problem and then uh, he, he goes to what is mass <laughs> And what do you say? Ability to resist changes in motion. And he gives the example of force equal mass times acceleration. He says when mass goes up, acceleration goes down because there's more resistance. What does that mean? What is that? That's a concept. And they're using this mass concept to say that a uh, singularity, which has infinite density, which has infinite mass and zero volume, right? Infinite density. Uh, has an effect on a star far away. What I want to know is what's uh, what's the mechanism? How does a singularity physically affect a star far away? That's what we need to understand. And for that, hopefully he doesn't put spirits in between that space and between the singularity and the star. So, you know, the black hole is nonsense because they never defined the word mass, primarily because of that. Okay? And then there uh, was a final point this fellow uh, mentioned, and that was um, gravity. And so what does he say about gravity? Well, he says, uh, he sends us to this guy's uh, site again, and this is what this fellow says. So, so look at what he's saying, okay? Uh, let it start again here. Give me a second. Okay, here it starts. And he says, a falling person is being attracted toward every particle in the earth. When they're outside the earth, all those particles are underneath them. But once they're inside, some of those particles are above them. Some of the earth is pulling them upward, which makes them lighter. Okay, that's why you move slower into the earth if you were to make a hole into the earth. That's his explanation. But see, he's being attracted by every particle on earth. And the question is, how do those particles attract him? I mean, are we going to put angels there, uh, spirits? Uh, what are we going to use? How, how does a particle attract you, one, and how does a particle pull you from behind, as he's saying there, okay? Because he says, once you enter the perimeter of the earth, if you go into that hole that you made into the earth all the way to the center, now he's got particles pulling you from behind you. So how does a particle pull on you? That's the issue. And that's the, uh, something that uh, quantum will never be able to answer. Never will be able to answer that question because you can't pull with particles. And that's what's wrong with quantum and that's why it's garbage, total garbage, total nonsense. You can't pull with discrete particles. You can't get a physical interpretation uh, for gravity using particles. And just in case, we'll put a little authority for those people who would like authority and uh, proof and evidence and 
experiments. Okay, so here we have authority, okay? And this is Richard Muller from UC Berkeley, and he says, so for example, if you have the Earth, there's the, a big mass here, and you have you with your little mass here, and that's uh, you there on top of the Earth, the big mass, that big M, that's the Earth, and you're sitting on top of the Earth, okay? And what he says, uh, he says, every atom on Earth is pulling, pulling on every atom of you. You're also pulling, pulling on it. The amazing thing about gravity is that it goes right through things. So how do you pull with particles? How does an atom pull on you? An atom from the Earth, right? And uh, yeah, under the rope model, it's, it's kids uh, play. It's uh, a, a, ch a child can understand it. And what's the difference? Okay, well here we have mathematical physics, discrete particles. And the rope hypothesis, every atom is interconnected in the universe. That's where the difference comes in. Okay, so, so if you want to know the difference, there you have it. Uh, the rope hypothesis says all atoms are interconnected. And yeah, now we can explain gravity very easily. Uh, because what? Let's, let's wait for it to start here. So now he says a falling person is being attracted towards every particle in the earth. Yeah, because they're tied to it. And when they're outside the earth, those particles are beneath them. But once they're inside, some of those particles are above them. So now you see them pulling from behind you. That's why. Because now you're dragging against those particles that are tugged behind you. You can only explain gravity with elongated uh, objects or uh, entities. And uh, the way we do it is saying that all atoms are interconnected, physically interconnected, okay? And of course, uh, people say, how do they get tangled? Uh, how come I can't see them? How, can I, how come I can't touch them? And I've covered that subject ad nauseum, so I'm not going to get into that. But the, the point is, the only way you can show it is action at a distance, is that you don't see the mediator. And there better be a mediator, otherwise you're filling that same space with spirits. Energy, mass, field, those are all spirits okay, that mathematical physics invented. Okay, and so why don't you fly off the Earth? Very simple, because every atom in your body is tied to every atom on Earth. Why doesn't the Chinese man on the other side of the planet fall off like the <laughs> flat earthers say? Well, because every atom of his body is also tied to every atom on earth, and so he's being pulled towards the center just like you. Doesn't matter which way that ball, the, the earth, right, uh, is facing, we're all pointed towards the center of the earth. Why? Because we're all physically tied to the center of the earth, okay? Okay, but what got me rolling? Uh, let's, let's begin uh, our uh, extinction theory today. Let's find out what's going on. Starts with this uh, comment that someone made. And this person says, the inability to grow store grains at scale. Those are Guy McPherson's words describing how extinction would likely take place. Not sure how this message is different than Mr. Gady. Guy has been saying this for decades. Whoa. Why do folks diss the original messenger? Jealousy? Hubris? It's sad. Well, what is sad is that this person didn't take the trouble to figure out what this site is about, first of all, and what I've said, because I've written it in my book, and uh, it differs completely from, uh, uh, from what Guy McPherson said. And he's not fearsome, he's just McPherson, okay? And uh, this is a discussion I had with McPherson and a person who represented him, okay, some time ago. And this is what, he, what I told him. I said, Guy McPherson is an idiot. He is an idiot because he is an environmentalist. An environmentalist is an idiot because he believes that humans are in danger of going extinct because of climate change or because we are too many and are ruining our environment. Please do not confuse me with Guy McPherson. He is a con conservationist, a climate changer, an individual who has no clue whatsoever about extinction. It is idiots who believe that humans will go extinct because of the environment or pollution or because we are too many. The dinos didn't disappear because the climate changed or because an asteroid struck the earth or because of pollution. They went extinct like humans will go extinct. Starvation. It is when we 
when uh, food runs out that mass extinctions occur. So uh, what is the issue? The issue is that Guy McPherson is a climate changer. He has no clue about extinction. He's never done extinction in his life. No environmentalist has ever done extinction, just like no economist has ever done extinction. And, and that's really down uh, up their alley. It should have been the economists who f should have figured out extinction of, of the human race. They never did because they're all so busy with the stock market and uh, interest rates and other nonsense. And so they never figured out what causes uh, the what will cause the extinction of man and what caused the extinction of past species. OK, so let's get first um, uh, some statements because, you know, Guy McPherson does say that it's food that's going to kill humans. And so this uh, person here says, oh, he, he said it already before you did. Well, I don't know about that, but let's concede. So he said starvation. Well, he's not the first one either. We've been saying starvation for a long time. Here are the, uh, some of the comments made in uh, different uh, sources. And you have for the Eurovision period, the entire base of the food chain is wiped out. Okay, so we're talking about food, right? Permian, with vegetation, the foundation of the food chain, starvation now runs rampant. Okay, so we got that. Cretaceous, photosynthesizing pho organisms, including photoplankton, uh, phytoplankton and land plants, form the foundation of the food chain in the late Cretaceous, as they do today. Evidence suggests that herbivorous animals died out when the plants they depended on for food became scarce. Consequently, top predators such as Tyrannosaurus rex also perished. Holocene, uh, major destruction of the vegetation. The burning over uh, broad areas of the continent would have destroyed the food sources for many of these animals, and we suggest that is why the larger animals preferentially became extinct. So if you were going to talk about food, you know, or starvation, that's been mentioned for a long time. I didn't invent starvation, neither did uh, McPherson. We didn't invent the, star the starvation scenario. I think, I think that's been there for a long time. What's the difference? The difference is the trigger. We need to figure out what triggers starvation, what triggers the mechanism that ends up uh, depriving animals of food, including us. What's going to deprive us of food? That's where we have the difference. McPherson says it's climate, and I think it's totally retarded. It's demented. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I have no respect for that at all. Anyone who mentions climate change should be executed, kicked out of science. And <laughs> their, their theory is garbage. Climate change never, never in the history of life on Earth wiped out a single species. Climate has nothing to do with anything. Okay, in fact, uh, the way I put it uh, in my book, uh, Why God Doesn't Exist, that's the name of my book. Uh, the way I put it is that Climate only favors the next generation. After the big guys are out, after the mass extinction occurs, whatever survives, which is another food chain, parallel food chain, those are the ones which are favored or unfavored by the climate because some animals will adapt better and they'll you know, run for the new niches because there's new food on the ground. And that's, what they're gonna, that's when climate change, if anything, has an effect. But not for her, for not for the end of a uh, uh, of a period in which ends in mass extinction. Mass extinction is not caused by climate change, and that's all these people who study, you know, the oxygen level and the carbon level. Uh, they're retarded individuals. All they want is funds from uh, for their projects, and then they come out and they prove what they set out to prove. Miraculously, you know, you have all these people studying uh, climate and say, oh, it's the carbon cycle. This guy studies the carbon cycle, comes back and says, I've got a theory, it's the carbon cycle. And the other guy says it's the oxygen cycle or the hydrogen cycle or whatever, and nitrogen or whatever, and comes back and says, oh, it's the nitrogen cycle. Because that's what they receive the funds for, and that's, they end up proving their foregone conclusions. So that's the way it works in the real, in the world of science, in the world of uh, 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 scientific literature, as they call it. Okay, okay. So, uh, do they mention starvation at all? I mean, they, you heard some statements right now about starvation. Is there a theory of starvation anywhere on planet Earth? 
Has there been one in the last 200 years? The answer is no. Here's, here's the uh, breakdown, okay? Two sources, one is from How, How Stuff Works, the other one's from Berkeley University. There are two groups of extinction theories. Listen carefully, okay? Catastrophic extinction and gradual extinction. That's it. Catastrophic extinction would have been caused by a sudden external event such as collision of the Earth with an asteroid or the eruption of a series of gigantic volcanoes, okay? Gradual extinction would have been a result of changes in the Earth's landmass and climate shifts, okay? It would also have been because new and better animals won in the struggle for existence. Competition. They always bring that stuff in. We competed against the Neanderthals and so on. Okay, the other one, Berkeley. Two main camps exist in paleontology today. The intrinsic gradualists and the extrinsic, extrinsic catastrophists. The intrinsic gradualists, volcanism, and plate tectonics. The intrins extrinsic catastrophists, a large extraterrestrial object collided with the Earth. Uh, astronomical stuff. You know, something which NASA likes a lot because they fund these projects. They say, hey, go study, see if uh, a supernova uh, killed the Ordovician animals. Or go study, see if, uh, you know, an asteroid hit the Earth during the Cretaceous. And so uh, it, it's self-interest because they need for people to think that it came from out, came from out of space. It came, came out of the sky, as Credence would say, okay? That's... that's that's all self-interest. It's got nothing to do with science. None of that. Okay. okay. Um, uh, so, so here's, um, just to make sure I cover Guy McPherson, to make sure that that's what he said. I'm not going to put words in his mouth. I'm going to use their words, put it here. Here's a fellow who represented him, uh, named uh, Davis. Most of his research, referring to Guy uh, McPherson, uh, had to do with range science. That is, under what conditions will the crops that humans and other animals be able to survive. It was while editing a book in 2002 on change, changing precipitation regimes and terrestrial ecosystems that he realized that as the climate became hotter, those crops would not be able to survive and mass starvation would be the result. I like the fact that they said 2002, you know, I, I wrote my book in 1998, so maybe even before Guy was born, you know, for all I know. But by 2007, he thought that global warming could be stopped if there w was a collapse of industrial civilization. However, in 2010, he read a paper on global uh, dimming and realized that if industrial civilization would collapse, the warming would occur even faster. What is guy talking about? He's talking about climate change, warming of the of the of the earth. He says those are going to destroy crops, and that's why we're going to starve. Okay, so the trigger in in uh, McPherson's theory is climate. Let's let's make sure that you understand that. Okay, that's not the trigger in my theory at all. Theory here is economics. Money, money will disappear. Money will be no more. Trade will be no more. We're going to stop trading because there will be nothing to trade. Uh, Hunter-gatherer who has food, he doesn't trade food with the other guy for food. No way. And that's what people today don't understand. Hunter-gatherer, especially basal hunter-gatherers like Neanderthal, they never did trade except to some retarded into, uh, paleontologists such as John Hawks who thinks that they traded seashells, I don't know, for prostitution. I don't, I don't know what he's got going through this brain. This guy doesn't know the first thing about uh, anthropology. And, and he supposedly uh, got a PhD or who knows where he got it. Some, uh, uh, some um, church. <laughs> okay, so uh, here, here's the step-by-step. So I want to make sure you understand, and Guy McPherson is talking about climate. He's not talking about the, econo the economy, okay? So here he goes. He says, uh, these are the steps, okay? He goes through, whether you believe it or not, this is what he says. The effect of this temperature increase is that these plants will die, and mass starvation will be the result. Climate? Yeah. 
Mass starvation in turn will mean a collapse of industrial civilization and a steep reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. Okay, This might seem beneficial at first since there would be a reduction in the emissions of CO2 and other so-called greenhouse gases, but the global average temperature will continue to rise due to the emission generated over the last 10-20 years. See, if you have all these fluorides that we sent out into uh, space, allegedly those eat up a lot of the ozone layer, leave holes or thinner layers of ozone, and the sun can get through there and kill the plants or warm the climate to uh, the temperature of the earth to a higher degree. That's, that's essentially the theory, okay? So it's got to do with that. And so here's the other part of that. Hope I put it in the right place. Put it on the right here so you can see it side by side. Uh, did I put it side by side? No, I put it here. <laughs> okay, and uh, here it is. He continues this. However, the reduction in the burning of fossil fuels will also result in the reduction of the emissions of aerosol particulates such as SO3, particularly from dirty coal, which reflects solar energy back into space before it reaches the Earth, the so-called global dimming effect. Great. These aerosol particulates uh, fall out of the atmosphere in a matter of weeks or months, and the global average temperature will rise another three degrees, causing the extinction of virtually all living beings on Earth. This could happen by next spring or the spring of the following year, so be prepared. Now, he said this like two years ago, but, you know, I, I, it's not that I'm going to make fun of him because of the timing. The timing is not important. He screwed up on the timing. That's like me. I screwed up on the timing as well. You know, our crystal balls are, are a little dim, okay? That's not the point. The point is the mechanism. And the mechanism that uh, McPherson proposes is climate change. He says something happens to the atmosphere because we, we're polluting it, and, and that's going to affect the climate inside the Earth, and it's going to rise to a higher degree. And one of the two, it kills us directly, or it burns all our crops, and or our crops don't grow, and so we all starve to death. That's his theory, in one way or another. That's not my theory whatsoever. That's not the trigger in my theory. For that matter, you, you know, you've got the people in the Cretaceous, uh, the Alvarez uh, theory, or the asteroid theory, which is a ridiculous theory, uh, says that an asteroid hit the Earth, and <clears throat> that asteroid triggered a whole bunch of phenomena that ended up killing all the dinosaurs. Otherwise, they would still be in New York City. Okay, that, That's what these guys are saying. And, you know, what can I say? It's, it's absolute nonsense. So what is the theory? Okay, let's go with the theory. Let's go with my theory to compare against guys, okay? And uh, here it is, uh, in a nutshell, okay? The history of life on Earth. What do you see there? Uh, I'm not going to talk about the non-vasculars, what came before, say, the Carboniferous and so on, because it's, uh, I'm not going to go into any details. I just want you to focus on the three major er um, uh, eras the age of ferns, the age of conifers, and the age of flowering plants, okay? So what is, what is the age of ferns? The age of ferns means that during a, like 100 million years, we had primarily ferns dominate the landscape. That's what it was. And there were certain animals, especially the synapsids, that grew in conjunction with those plants. That's what they ate because there was nothing else around, or that was what mostly covered the vegetation on Earth. Then, uh, uh, you know, when that uh, cycle ended, what started was the age of conifers, especially cycads and cycadioids, cycad like uh, Williamsonians and so on. Uh, and this is the age of conifers. And this is the uh, age of dinosaurs. Essentially, it uh, involves the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Uh, Jurassic, you had the long necks. Those are the most prominent animals. The Cretaceous, we have typically the T-Rex there. And then we went, that died 65 million years ago, and what continued was the age of flowering plants. Okay? So this is the history of life on Earth, of plants. When the plants die, the animals that forge the relationship, a long-term relationship, a hundred million year relationship with those plants, when the plants go, those animals go. Because they can't switch their diet at the last moment and start eating weeds. You know, uh, as far as the um, synapsids and uh, the mammal-like uh, reptiles that, uh, as they're known uh, in the um, 
in the Permian. As far as those animals were concerned, uh, the um, conifers that were starting up, the cycads, cycadioids, which were tiny, tiny plants at the time, they had these big uh, uh, forests of, um, of ferns, and that's what they ate. And all this other stuff, they were weeds. They didn't eat that stuff. And who grew with those? Well, the little tiny uh, animals that are going to become uh, first the archosaurs, that's in the Triassic, but then later on the dinosaurs. And so uh, this group went down the other, the other food chain continued rolling because it didn't affect them at all uh, what was happening to the synapsids and the mammal-like reptiles. When those animals collapsed, uh, they collapsed because the food chain collapsed. And those animals that did not belong to that food chain continued growing. No problem at all. Same thing happened at the end of the Cretaceous. When the uh, conifers went down, became extinct, or not became extinct because they didn't become completely extinct, but the forest shrunk. They, uh, the land was eaten up by the, uh, uh, by the uh, uh, angiosperms. As the angiosperms took more and more land, the dinosaurs were left in smaller and smaller islands forests, jungles, their, their, the world was collapsing. And so not only did they lose species, number of species over time because there were not enough niches to occupy, but, uh, but they were fewer and fewer animals eventually until they finally became extinct. Because, uh, you know, you, you need food to feed these animals and they, they forged a relationship of hundreds of millions of years, a hundred million years at least, uh, with these plants, they're not going to change uh, their diet at the last moment and say, now I'm going to eat angiosperms, I'm going to eat the flowering plants, I'm going to eat magnolias and roses. No way! They, they, as far as they were concerned, those were weeds. Okay? And, and yeah, that's when they were replaced by the mammals. So, uh, this is predictable that when, when, not if, but when, because this is the history of life on Earth, when a certain type of plant, very general family of plants, right, goes extinct, the animals that forge a relationship with them will, go also, will also go extinct. What does that mean? A mass extinction can be predicted if you stood at the Cambrian line, at, you know, 542 million years ago, if you stood there and looked forward, you can predict, that is, when this plant disappears, all the animals that depended on these types of plants, they will disappear as well. And there is no theory among paleontologists that says that. It's a predictable theory. You, you should be able to uh, put your finger on that and say, look, when the plant disappears, the animals will disappear. And what are these people thinking of? Oh, they'll switch their diet. Now they'll, they'll be eating uh, weeds instead of, uh, you know, what they ate. So if they were eating, eating conifers like, you know, the cones of cycads, maybe that's what they were eating. Uh, oh, no, there's no more cones? No problem. We'll, we'll just eat uh, peaches. How's that? Or lettuce. You think that's possible? Uh, does a rabbit switch to pine trees or pine leaves when uh, he doesn't have any carrots or, or lettuce? Do you think a rabbit would eat that just because a plant is a plant is a plant, so any plant will do? No, of course not. Rabbit is, is tied to lettuce, to, to grass, to stuff that he eats. He, he's tied to the grasses, essentially. Those are called grasses, you know, the uh, corn and wheat and all that. So whatever they eat, it's, it's grasses. And uh, they don't switch over to ferns. No, no mammal eats ferns, and no mammal eats uh, conifers. You know, so this is what you got to keep in mind. You're not going to switch at the last moment to another type of food. And until you understand this, you don't understand extinction. And if you don't understand extinction, which is extinction 101, you can't move on to extinction 102, which is the human extinction. Everybody's an expert in human extinction and why uh, humans are not going to disappear. Oh, they're expert. Everybody's an expert on that. They can talk hours on why man is not going to disappear because, you know, all they talk about is politics and how they can handle the economy and blah, blah, blah. Not one of those p persons is an expert on extinction. See, first you got to tell me how the animals in the past died. Okay? You got to tell me how the... The triceratops died. You have to tell me how the archosaurs died. You have to tell me how the synapsis died. When you're an expert there, then you can take, you know, uh, uh, extinction 102, which is human extinction. 
And so if all mass extinctions, all mass extinctions were due to starvation because the food disappeared, the, the primary production disappeared from under the feet of the animals, these wild animals, and that's when they died, when they couldn't find any more food, or it was harder and harder to find food as, as their, um, their sources dried out. Well, then the herbivores first died, and, and what followed were the uh, carnivores. So now you can understand that. You can understand extinction. And if that's how they, all these mass extinctions occurred, what's going to change with humans? Can we avoid extinction somehow? And the answer is no. The answer is no because we produce our own food and we only do it for money. So we don't have to look at climate change. We've got to look at money. We've got to look at what produces food. And what produces food is money. That's what produces food. Okay, without money, there's no production of food. Today, we have all these big corporations, agricultural corporations. What they do, they produce the food and distribute it to the cities. And all you got to do is have some money, and that's created by the service economy, a fake economy where, uh, like I said the other day, it's um, an unemployment economy. Anyone working in services is unemployed. And you say, Bill, you're crazy. <laughs> Uh, well, let me let me enlighten you. The other day, uh, the United States lost 30 million workers. 30 million people went to the unemployment line. And I guess 90% of them were hotel, restaurants, uh, airline, you know, tourism. Did we suffer at all? Not at all, because we don't need those jobs. Not, not for, I mean, we need those jobs to make a buck, yeah. But we don't need those jobs to survive on Earth. Because all those people were unemployed to begin with. They're, they were not real jobs. Uh, un, um, restaurant and hotel, you know, we don't need those. You can stay at home. You don't have to go on vacation. Uh, you can eat at home, okay? Why do we go to hotels to sleep and why do we go to restaurants to eat? Well, because it's a luxury. We go on vacation maybe or maybe we have to go to another city for work or whatever. So we go to a hotel and then we go to a restaurant. Or you might take the old lady, you know, on Wednesday, say, hey, you know, stop cooking tonight. We're, we're going to go to a restaurant and eat over there. So it's a luxury because what? You have this waiter, he comes over and he says, yes, sir, what would you like? And, and you say, well, I'd like a good beef steak and a good bottle of wine. So the guy goes out and he does all this work, uh, cook over there as well, and they bring it to you and they serve you. So it's a luxury economy. You know, uh, all that stuff is not needed. And we showed that uh, you don't need it because, you know, 30 million workers went out of work and no one felt a, a pinch of that. In other words, no one died uh, of starvation because of that. Okay? We didn't need those jobs. And that shows that that was unemployment, mass unemployment. And then you have the uh, situation where, uh, you know, you, you've got all these other jobs that are dependent on that. What do we do? Well, we earn a salary wages or whatever so that we can exchange it essentially for food we all work for food even bill gates works for food and uh, he's got billions and he can buy billions of food but he doesn't eat billions of food he doesn't eat billions of pounds or kilograms of food he eats just as much as you do and that's all he needs to live one more day because if bill gates doesn't eat for five days or ten days or a couple weeks or a year I'm sure he's going to die. Okay? So that's all he needs. Every penny we produce in the service economy is just re, uh, re um, entered into the economy uh, by buying food. That's what it is. And uh, yeah, now we have all this food that suddenly disappeared from the shelves. <laughs> uh, especially toilet paper. <laughs> Uh, why? You would say, why would food disappear? Why didn't people just continue buying normally? Why has food suddenly become a, a problem? You would think that, okay, so we kicked a lot of workers out of uh, their jobs. Okay, so we keep buying food normally and we have the regular flow of food into the supermarkets. Why is there suddenly a big problem with food where, where food is scarce? Where uh, Here in Germany, where I'm at, uh, food is limited uh, to two packages uh, per person. In other words, if you buy flour, if you buy rice, if you buy, uh, I don't know, uh, spaghetti, well, you're limited to two packages. They won't let you take more than two in, in most stores at least. And so the question is, why? 
why rationing? I mean, you would think this is a bonanza for the big corporations and they would start saying, hey, you know, let's, let's put more food out because people are buying. Let, this is a chance to make a killing. That's not what's happening. It's not capitalism. What, what was implemented was communism, rationing. <laughs> and so get ready for uh, some big problems because uh, all these countries, uh, advanced nations, they're going to be rationing everything. My uh, niece, my nephews who live in Japan, they have the same situation over there. They say uh, the food is being rationed, especially in Japan, which imports probably most of its food. So, yeah, uh, food is the first thing you got to think about. And it's got nothing to do with climate change. It's got to do with the economy, as you can see. Okay, so let's see. Um, here's the, another version of the history of plants, okay, so that you can get a snapshot. And again, you can see that certain plants dominated during certain periods of human history, of, of hum the history of life on Earth. And those plants are no longer dominant. In fact, a lot of them went extinct altogether. The cycadioids, the cycad likes, uh, you know, they're gone. <laughs> The, the, you know, we only see them in the rock uh, these days and figure out, you know, how this plant could have been, okay? And yeah, so you can see the uh, trend there. Uh, those plants disappear, whatever animal carved a niche in those plants, they're gone, okay? And that's what a mass extinction is all about. Um, here's, uh, here's another uh, version. The chronological, this is specifically for the Cretaceous, but it applies to um, any period. And that's what occurs in a mass extinction is a chronological uh, selectivity. It's a chronological extinction. What dies are the old species, the ones that uh, relied on old sources of food, and there's new sources of food that are coming up which they don't eat, and those only favor the, the, a parallel um, uh, food chain. So what died were ammonites, uh, dinosaurs on land, uh, you had a lot of uh, foraminifera die in the oceans, uh, diatoms, and you, all, all sorts of uh, animals that died in, in the sea and on land, especially the, uh, in the sea you had the mosasaurs, the, um, uh, what is it, the, um, the big reptiles that dominated the seas. Well, all those animals, why? Because they were old. They, re, they, de, they were part of the food chain of animals that had been around for 100 million years. That's why they died. Because it's the old that die and the young that radiate once the big guys are out of the way. And those new guys, those young, uh, that, that new generation of animals, those uh, are the ones that radiate, become bigger, and you know, take over certain niches. They, they occupy niches in the vegetation. And uh, so, so that's the story of life on Earth, and that's the story of a mass extinction. Okay? It's got to do with an economic collapse. It's the ecological uh, pyramid that uh, dies. And so let's talk about that here a second, if I can get it in here. Okay, this is a healthy pyramid. That's what a healthy uh, ecological pyramid is. You have a 10 to 1 ratio, more or less, between trophic levels. Uh, primary production is about 10 to 1 to herbivores, and herbivores are approximately 10 to 1 to predators. That's a healthy pyramid. Okay? What is an unhealthy pyramid? Well, an unhealthy pyramid is what humans have. And here's the unhealthy pyramid side by side. Hopefully I can get it up here. Okay? And you can see it doesn't look very pyramidal. It looks kind of uh, wishy-washy. Uh, you have too many predators at the top, especially us, right? And you have all these um, uh, animals that we, uh, we raise uh, for meat, and then the rest of our diet depends on cereals. Primarily, you know, all the cereals are grasses. And so there you have a, 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 a snapshot of what's happening. Now, this, I, I took this a few years back, so the numbers are higher now. But uh, the pyramid is, structure is, is the same, essentially. What you have is many humans, close to 8 billion humans, relying on maybe, I don't know today, maybe it's 5.5 billion uh, livestock, uh, large animals, and then uh, that does not include uh, uh, chickens and fish. But uh, you got, again, 18 billion of those, so you get a, a fair amount of meat. 
Okay, and the rest comes from cereals, and that come and that accounts for 87% of our primary production. Does that grow in the wild? Absolutely not. All that stuff grows where it grows in farms. We farm. Uh, we have. Uh, remember, we have domesticated both animals and plants, at least since the Neolithic. So uh, that's that's how we live today. But why do we produce this? We produce it for money. Right now, you've got uh, farmers in, uh, in the United States killing <laughs> animals because they can't get them to market. I really don't know what the problem is, but apparently uh, uh, someone's not uh, buying those uh, animals, uh, partly because of this virus, and uh, so some of the plants are being closed, uh, the slaughterhouses, and that food is being destroyed, and it's all an economic issue. You know, uh, people are buying rice and whatever, maybe, and uh, toilet paper, and they're not buying, you know, meat. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what the problem is, but it just gives you an idea that this is an economic problem exclusively. This has nothing to do with climate change, okay? So let's get that straight. The trigger is what's different between some of these people and what I propose, okay? And... Uh, and let's see, I got a couple more here. So, so here's the summary, okay? What happens in a mass extinction, which is going to happen to man, is that we have a, an overturning of the ecological pyramid, essentially. And here's a diagram of that, a little picture. Uh, we have a healthy one on the left, which is a 10 to 1 ratio between these three trophic levels. And that overturns, essentially. We have uh, little primary production, uh, some herbivores eating on that, and predators a bunch. And we're the predators. We're the top predator of the planet. So we're the guys who are in that pink spot on the top. And uh, what's going to happen is the food chain beneath us is going to disappear. Why does it disappear? Is it some kind of uh, climatic uh, change? Uh, we're going to have climate change. Is that what it is? The heat, the cold, whatever's going to affect our food chain? Absolutely not. It's going to be the money. Uh, what's going to happen is our, our uh, uh, global economy is going to collapse. And I've been saying that for 20 years. Now, the virus only made it apparent to many people, okay? And I'm not saying it's going to happen in the next few days. Uh, there's probably going to be a recovery to some degree. But what are we having? We're, having, we're going to have eventually more and more unemployed, which includes all the service, people in the United States, that's 80% of the workers, all those people as far as I'm concerned are unemployed, or most of them are. We're going to have some unemployment, uh, meaning that it's not, they're not going to be paid by um, companies, by private corporations, they're going to be paid by government through welfare or unemployment or whatever. And so we're going to have all this mass of unemployed people, okay, and that number is going to increase. That's what I'm predicting, that's what I'm saying that should happen. and the workers, the people who actually have a job, they're going to be fewer and fewer. And so the real wages are going to go down. Why? Because the government has to print money in order to pay those people who don't work. Right now, they gave out $2.2 trillion to everybody, you know, and that's probably the first uh, uh, installment. Maybe there's going to be another one. And what does that mean? You're devaluating the real wages of those who work. And at some point, at some point, there's going to be a special ratio where those people who work cannot make it to the end of the month. A lot of them won't be able to make it to the end of the month, and it's not going to pay for them to work. They might as well go on the unemployment line or on the welfare line because what's the point of working if you're only going to get 95% of the salary that you need to, to make it to the end of the month? That's the issue. And so I think that ratio is going to come around the more money that is being printed. Okay, that's, that's the theory. Okay, okay so um, when there was a comment along those lines. I want to address that comment. And uh, this person asks, uh, some correct details with an incorrect conclusion. Aha, uh -huh. okay. The lack of money will not make food disappear. Okay. Uh, this theory is based on the assumption that people do things only for money, which is simply not the case. Whoa! People do things for other than money? I don't know. Uh, I should ask the prostitute down the corner and see if she does anything for other than money, you know? We'll find out. Uh, I'll ask her. Uh, I'll run, a, I'll run a, uh, a poll among prostitutes, see if they uh, do anything for any, a thing other than money. Also, money will not disappear. Uh, there are a bunch of things that can do, that can and do substitute it temporarily and permanently as well. 
Furthermore, you forgot to give definition of critical components in your theory, most of all money itself. What you do so proudly in your physical theory very correctly. This theory is extremely unimaginative to say the least. Okay, that's his criticism. And so here, let me show you a, a little graph okay, that I had in one of my papers. Okay, and uh, this is money through the ages, essentially. It's a snapshot. And at some point, you know, uh, food was money. Uh, if you go to the book of Ruth in, in the Bible, uh, she was paid with um, barley. <laughs> and she needed for her uh, mother-in-law as well. So she, she worked hard to get two rations, one for her mother and one for her. She was paid with food. And, and if you look at the, uh, uh, what is it, the, um, some of the old codes, like the Babylonian code or the uh, Hittite codes. Again, a lot of that was uh, paid with food. They were in that transition where they were receiving uh, coins, but also when they, where they were doing things for food. And then at some point we went into gold and silver, then we went into paper money, and today we even got rid of all that and we have electronic money, okay, in different ways. And uh, so, so we've had different kinds of money. And so this person asks for money. What is the definition of money? Okay. See if I can find myself here so I can put myself back in here. Uh, so what is the definition of money? Well, we don't need a definition for money. And let me tell you why. Because money is anything that you trade. The issue is trade, not money. Money is trade and trade is money. And the prostitute also, she trades something for money. And what she's trading is known as money. She gives a service, and that, that is money. That's cash. Take, she can take it to the bank. Why? Because she receives money in exchange for that. So money is anything that you trade. If the other guy accepts it, that's money. So if you trade a buffalo for, I don't know, for a gun like the Indians used to do, you know, okay, that's money on both sides. So we don't need, what I'm saying is trade will be no more. And so it doesn't matter if the United States takes the greenback and turns it into a brownback now and says, well, from now on, we're going to have brownbacks, no more greenbacks, okay? It doesn't matter. The, the government still has debt up to its, you know, head. <laughs> and uh, it's got to pay the, the, the people so that people don't starve and don't go out stealing and robbing and killing. And so to keep the peace, they have to give them money, and they're going to produce that money out of the uh, little machine, you know? Uh, in fact, they don't even need the machine anymore. Just put another couple zeros in the... Uh, global economy they just throw them in there you know they just create money from heaven and what that does is devalue the uh, the value the real va wages of those who work and so that's what's going to happen from now on there's just going to be a devalue a constant devaluation of money how long that's going to last how long that process is going to last well only god knows up there right so uh that's that's what i'm saying is going to happen and uh, so uh, the other thing I wanted to say before I leave is this, and it's got to do with a comment made by uh, Guy McPherson. And he said, that he, uh, this was the fellow who talked for Guy McPherson first, and he said, Davis, as relied on Arctic uh, scientists to establish the danger posed by the warming of seabeds in the shallow Arctic uh, seas and terms of the release of gigatons of methane and there's a lot of theories on methane for the Permian especially uh, uh, Looney called uh, Paul Wignall he talks about methane coming out of the seabeds a bunch of nonsense they pay him a trip to go to Greenland and I think Iceland and uh, just to study the methane that comes out and wouldn't you know it he proved that it is methane that killed uh, the Permian uh, synapses great uh, but the point I want to say is his, claim, his claims are all based on peer-reviewed pay, uh, science. Peer-reviewed. Whoa, it's peer-reviewed, okay? And uh, so the question is, who, who's, who are the peer reviewers? Well, it's the guy who was sucked up uh, because otherwise he wouldn't get a job if he didn't, or wouldn't even get a degree if he didn't suck up. And those are the people who perpetuate the previous theories. That's why you're not going to get any theory from any of these guys from the universities because all they do is suck up. They have to suck up in order to pass the test, to get their degree, and to get a job, to get a career. So they're not thinkers. You're, you're probably going to get a, a better result from independent thinkers who try to reason it out and not from these guys who get a degree simply because they marked the letter D on the test and that was the correct answer because they just memorized it. 
So, so I don't give a damn about peer reviewers. I have loathing for peer reviewers. They, they, you know, not even worth talking about them. Anyways, Guy McPherson entered the discussion. He said, "Bill Gates doesn't use evidence, <laughs> and he's not." Uh, he's not read the abundant evidence I've com uh, compiled. Color me shocked. Yeah, uh, McPherson should take an intro introductory course in science because he's he's still um, operating with the old notion uh, from the 17th century, uh, archaic, archaic science. Uh, and we call it the, not the scientific method, we call it the religious method. What he's do doing is religion. Anyone presenting evidence, anyone who wants to demonstrate, anyone who wants to prove, he's doing religion. We don't provide evidence in science. What we do in science, we explain a mechanism so that you understand it. Now, so, not so that you believe it. Whether you believe it or not, that's your personal opinion. It doesn't concern science at all. So we do not present evidence. Any person who presents evidence, we call him an idiot. Okay, And he's doing religion. He's not doing science. So here, uh, here's the uh, rational scientific method so that people are come up to speed. There's been a change in the uh, paradigm. There's been a paradigm shift starting at the beginning of this century, 21st century. And all those who want to do science had better come up to speed. And here it is, okay? And so what is science? Science is rational explanations. And we do have a definition for both rational and for the word explanation. I'm not going to cover that today. Covered that in the past. Um, Physics, what does it deal? Rational explanations of phenomena, okay? And we want to explain causes and mechanisms. And the, uh, what is it, the uh, um, uh, bottom line for uh, physics the, uh, is, are the objects. You can't do physics without an object, okay? Uh, and in the case of philosophy, we have explanations for behaviors, and we try to explain reasons and purpose, okay? And... Uh, Bread and butter of philosophy is the concept. Where do we put uh, experiments? Well, over there in religion. Anyone presenting experiment? We don't. We don't do experiments at a conference. What we do uh, at a conference is we explain something, so that people understand ob the objective phenomenon that we're trying to explain. And, and in this case, uh, we don't have no use for experiments because experiment only has to do with evidence, and evidence has to do with persuading and convincing the jury. That's what experiment and evidence have to do, uh, do with. So we do not present evidence because the prosecutor presents evidence only when he tries to sway the jury to his side of the case. And yeah, uh, you have all the uh, supernatural theories which involve generally all the uh, um, traditional religions. And then we have the irrational theories which are the modern theories and there you have all of them, mathematical physics in its entirety, theism, atheism, agnosticism, all those are uh, irrational theories, okay? And I've covered that in the past as well, uh, so no need to, re, uh, to rehash those, at least for those people who've been following this channel. Uh, so yeah, in, in science, we do not present evidence. Uh, what we do is explain a mechanism so the person understands it, and that's where science ends. What continues thereafter is religion, belief, opinion. Whether you believe the theory, whether you believe that's the mechanism Mother Nature uses to do some of her dirty work or her clean work, in fact, right? Invisible work, uh, her invisible agents like gravity, right? Uh, that's your personal opinion. We don't care. We just explain the mechanism so that you understand it. And with that, I'll see you, what is it, on Wednesday? And uh, I hope you have <laughs> a, a great uh, week. And I hope if the uh, virus doesn't get you and that the end of the world uh, takes a little time in coming. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.